Hello, we're filming at Bright Event Productions. Welcome to the Nashville Fashion Week Digital Experience. I'm Connie Cathcart Richardson, and this is my partner, Marsha Masula. We're co-founders and managing partners of Nashville Fashion Week and the Nashville Fashion Forward Fund of the Community Foundation of Middle Tennessee. This week looks much different than we had originally planned for April. Despite a tornado, a global pandemic, social injustice, and many other obstacles, we have put together five days of free digital programming to celebrate all things Nashville fashion from the comfort and safety of our own homes. It is our pleasure to present Fashion Talks, three learning labs, 19 local designers, and daily shop Nashville retail events and promotions. These were designed to impact, engage, and encourage our local fashion community. We want you to get to know and support the people, brands, and businesses that are Nashville Fashion. Nashville Fashion Week was conceived in 2010 to foster Nashville's heralded community spirit and concentration of creative, fashion-forward, and entrepreneurial talent. We have grown tremendously since then, and in our 10th year, we took the necessary steps to continue safely supporting the fashion community during a time when they need it the most. While our funding is completely based on sponsorships and ticket sales for our live events, we too felt the heavy losses of the challenging circumstances we, that we are all experiencing right now. The Nashville Fashion Forward Fund of the Community Professionals with TIE is an endowed fund that supports the next generation of fashion industry professionals with ties to Middle Tennessee. This fund provides an annual financial award and resources for experiential professional development opportunities. Normally, 100% of the proceeds from Nashville Fashion Week benefits the fund for a single award. We were able to make an exception due to extenuating circumstances and issued $500 grants to all 19 participating 2020 designers. We recognize the significance in offering encouragement and financial assistance to help them transition during this time. We also have made all of our digital programming free and donated over 1,000 masks to Mass Now Tennessee thanks to the pre-sales of our We Are Nashville t-shirts and our sponsors, On Point Manufacturing. We encourage you to continue to celebrate and support our fashion community this week and for the upcoming months of uncertainty. And if you're able and capable, we hope that you also consider making a donation to our Nashville Fashion Forward Fund at NashvilleFashionWeek.com. Stay safe, and we hope to see you in person for Nashville Fashion Week 2021. Hello and welcome to day four of the Nashville Fashion Week Digital Experience. This is our final learning lab of the week. Um, we've had over 700 people sign up and anybody that signs in for any of these four events is registered for two all access passes to our next live Nashville Fashion Week valued at $800. I hope you win. Today we are going to explore fashion law for your fashion business presented by Ritholtz Levy Fields. Please excuse any technical difficulties that we might have. Going live is always a little bit scary. Jenna Harris and Dan Zupnick from RLF will address corporate, commercial, and intellectual property law issues faced by emerging and established fashion and apparel businesses. Unfortunately, Peter Fields is unable to join us today due to an unexpected death in his family. We give he and his family our sincere condolences and big thanks to Dan for stepping up on such short notice. RLF is a dynamic and fast-growing law firm with offices in Nashville, New York, LA, and Miami. Representing clients in media, entertainment, fashion, technology, and general brand-based businesses across a wide variety of corporate, commercial, and intellectual property law disciplines. With decades of experience as lawyers, and in some cases, former executives in these fields, the firm brings an insider's perspective and a sophisticated approach to provide cost-effective and business-centric solutions to its clients. The firm has a key focus in helping its clients fund and launch new businesses, grow them, and take them from public and private liquidity events, especially clients that leverage creative work such as fashion and apparel companies. We're going to leave about 10 minutes at the end for Q&A. We preloaded some um, select questions that you've already sent. We'll be watching the chats for um, anything that adds to the conversation. And it's without further ado that I am pleased to introduce you to Miss Jenna Harris from Nashville and Dan Zupnick from LA of Rit Holtz Levy Fields. Thank y'all. Hello there. And 
Thank you for that introduction, Connie. Um, I appreciate each of you joining us today. As Connie mentioned, I am Jenna Harris on behalf of Ritholtz Levy Fields, and today my colleague Dan Zepnik from our New York office will be discussing fashion law for your fashion business. So I think the appropriate place to begin is what even is fashion law? Um, I'm going to share my screen to talk through a few points and then come back to explain how some of the specific legal principles can be applied to your business. Okay, so <clears throat> what is fashion law? It's an area of practice focusing on all aspects of fashion from conception to protection. Industry-wide, it applies to fashion and apparel, accessory, cosmetic, jewelry, and footwear. <clears throat> Our client base is typically uh, composed of designers, brands, manufacturers, distributors, retailers, models, photographers, and influencers. And issues we see um, relate to creation, intellectual property protection, enforcement, licensing, expansion, partnerships, and consumer protection. And I'm sure I've left off a few others. Um, generally speaking, while lawyers may specialize in particular areas of practice, we're usually divided into three groups in terms of what we do day to day. And those are transactional lawyers, in-house counsel, and litigators. Um, and I'll touch back on that in just a little bit. So the context of our representation in terms of fashion law encompasses creation, formation, negotiation, protection, and litigation. Um, today, I'm going to touch on the creation, protection, and a little bit about litigation. And Dan, as Connie mentioned, will go over some of the corporate and commercial issues that deal with formation and negotiation and what he sees um, day to day. And so for, for fashion clients, um, we handle all aspects, the context of legal representation um, in terms of fashion law, like I said, encompasses those four areas. So starting with um, fashion clients, we handle all aspects of creation, business formation, contract negotiation, and transactional deals relating to um, a number of different issues regarding your business, such as partnerships and licensing, um, obtaining rights in and protection over your intellectual property rights, so your name, your image, your trademark, products, services, designs, and photographs, um, and hopefully not for any of you, litigation. So this is one of the three groups I mentioned where, as opposed to the transactional side, which mostly deals with creation and formation and negotiation side of things, our representation relates to a lawsuit or a pre-lawsuit activity. Um, and that typically involves a dispute over the terms of an agreement, a party's obligations or performance or failure to perform under an agreement, or the enforcement of intellectual property rights, where um, this is traditionally in the form of an infringement action where you may be enforcing your rights against an infringer or counterfeiter, or they are enforcing rights they believe they possess against you. Okay, so starting with the creation, this refers to um, generally the conception of your business and how it relates to one or more of the industries and types of clients that I mentioned initially. So one of the concepts we often use to identify creation and conception in the fashion industry is branding meaning identification first of what it is that you want to create, a work of art, a product, a service, and then honing in on who your audience will be, what you want to communicate, your brand message, how you want to be perceived, 
your identity, what purpose you want to serve, mission statement, how you want to be heard and what you want to say, your voice, and then finding ways to reiterate that consistently across the board so that you can achieve recognition and obtain protection. So consistency is key for a number of reasons, um, but particularly when we're talking about intellectual property protection and trademark. Which brings us to our next area of representation. Um, so to touch on this quickly, a trademark is legally defined as a symbol, sound, word, words, color, smell, or combination thereof that identifies in the minds of consumers the source from which that particular good or service originates. A copyright is an original work of art fixed in a tangible medium of expression. And I included this because patents can be used as an avenue for protection of certain designs, although I will not go into much deep detail about patent law for purposes of this presentation, but design patents can protect ornamental designs so long as they are new, original, and non-obvious. Okay, I'm trying to get my video back on here, guys. Sorry, oh, there we go. Okay, so protection um, in the legal sense, as it relates to the fashion industry, um, arises under trademark, copyright, and patent law for the most part. And as much as I wish I could sit here and tell you all the wonderful and clear ways that the law protects the fashion industry and all of its many components, um, that would be a fantasy because the truth is current law is seriously lacking with respect to protections that are afforded to designs, to apparel, um, and the numbers related to counterfeit sales are sickening and rising every year. But that said, there are still many laws in place that protect against trademark, copyright, and patent infringement, as well as counterfeit goods. And we're seeing new cases every year that are slowly creating more options and also clarifying and expanding the laws for rights holders so that you all can enforce the rights associated with your creations. So beginning with trademark, um, those rights relate to a good or service and they become effective the moment that you use your name, your symbol, your jingle, whatever it is in commerce. Um, and use in commerce relates to the sale, public promotion, actual distribution, things like that. So it's not necessarily when you conceive of the trademark, trade dress or trade name, but when you actually put it out into the world. That's when you obtain the rights and protection under what we refer to as common law. Um, but before use, it's important to do your due diligence or engage a lawyer to assist you with clearance to ensure that the mark or name you're seeking to use does not already exist elsewhere in connection with the same or similar goods or services that you intend to provide. So once you have that squared away, you can decide how you want to protect those rights, whether that is sticking with the common law rights that will attach whenever you first you whenever your your first use in commerce occurs, or whether you want to seek federal trademark registration by submitting an application to the United States Patent and Trademark Office. And the benefit of federal registration is that it provides broad protection across the entire United States and it acts as a monopoly over anyone else who may subsequently try to use the same, same or similar name or mark um, or symbol in connection with the same or similar 
goods or services as you. So while the trademark office is stringent in its requirements that you show actual use in commerce in order to obtain a federal registration, there's also a mechanism called an intent to use application through which you can get the benefit of an earlier date of protection, essentially the date um, when, in connection with your business planning when you conceive of the name or symbol that you wanna use. Um, and this is as opposed to the date when you actually use the mark in commerce. Uh, but the catch is it has to be so long as you have a bona fide intent to actually use the mark in commerce and you're actually doing things um, in connection with your business formation to make it possible for your first use in commerce to occur. Regarding copyright, those rights too are affixed immediately upon the creation and fixation of your work. So meaning it's got to be more than just an idea. Again, it must be fixed in a tangible form of expression that can be seen or heard. Similar to the trademark office, you can obtain federal copyright registration by submitting an application to the copyright office. Um, slightly different from trademark though is federal registration of a copyright is required in order to enforce your rights against an infringer through a lawsuit. So um, you just, you must have a registration in order to bring a claim if you're thinking about in initiating a litigation action against an infringer. <clears throat> So what do these really protect in terms of fashion? For trademark, it's your brand, which can be your most valuable asset, whether it's a name, a symbol, a color, a scent, a sound. Yes, all of those things can be protectable under trademark law. Um, it's that thing that when consumers see or hear or smell, they automatically think of you. So examples include, you know, the big names like Gucci, Fendi, Prada, or handbags. Um, here we think of Laura Citron, we think of metallic sparkly suits, any old iron, we have, think of maybe studded fringed blazers, um, the checkered square damier design also for handbags, belts, and shoes identifies the source of the product as being Louis Vuitton. Um, red soles on stilettos acting as a source identifier of Christian Louboutin. For copyright, the protection is for your work, your creation, your photograph, your image, textile designs are all protectable. Um, you are given a set of exclusive rights when you obtain copyright protection, which allow you to use that copyright in any medium of expression. It is important to note, however, that there are limitations on the protections of designs and articles of apparel. And this is because most of what we wear serves a functional purpose, right? And it would be unjust to give one person exclusive rights, for example, to create and sell t-shirts in the form as we traditionally see them. So when we envision certain articles of clothing and apparel, um, just using that as an example because it's an easy shape um, to, to think of, you have hats, shirts, pants, shoes. We classify as useful articles because they're serving a utilitarian and functional purpose of protecting and covering our bodies. Um, the outer basic design of those articles is not entitled to exclusive protection through copyright or through any other mechanism. But the Copyright Act um, does provide protection for useful articles that contain certain design elements that contain pictorial, graphical, or sculptural works which in the fashion context includes two or three dimensional works of fine graphic and applied art, photographs, prints, and art reproductions. Um, and you might be thinking, what in the world does that even mean? 
um, it's, it's quite complicated. And to be honest, we just got clarity on this from the Supreme Court in 2017. So before then, it was a lot of gray. Um, now we have a little bit of clarity, but there's still a long way to go. So simply put, the Supreme Court of the United States has determined that these protections are afforded um, under the Copyright Act for designs where the pictorial, graphical, or sculptural features of a design can be identified separately from the article of apparel. And that means that you can physically or conceptually envision the design separate from the article of apparel. And those features would be clearly recognizable as separate from the article. And two, where those pictorial, graphical, or sculptural features can exist independently from the utilitarian aspects of the article. So when we're talking about, for example, again, just using apparel because it's an easy example, the pockets on a shirt, um, collar, sleeves, the neckline, meaning those features can exist side by side with the article and be perceived as an independent artistic work. So if that's the case, then the designs are um, offered protections under the Copyright Act, which is a huge step, step in the right direction for um, designers getting some form of protectability for their unique creations. The next hurdle um, that you must overcome though is originality. And unfortunately, in the case where we got this law from 2017, the court didn't touch on orig originality. There was still a question as to whether the designs at issue, um, which funny enough involved cheerleading uniforms, were original enough that they were entitled to protection. So that was another hurdle they had to come over. But at the very least, now we have clarity from the court as to um, the threshold for design features on articles um, to be able to be entitled to protection under the Copyright Act. So the good news is um, I think we're on the road to seeing more cases like that that are not only um, clarifying the law but expanding it for the fashion industry. So with that, I will pass it over to Dan. Hello, everyone. Thanks for joining today. Uh, I'm Dan Zupnik. I am Jenna's colleague. I am based in our New York office at the moment, but uh, did spend several years in our, our LA office for Connie's introduction. And uh, I work um, I've been a, a core part of our uh, fashion practice group, along with Jenna and some of our other partners. Uh, been with the firm for eight years now. And I'm going to talk a little bit about the business part of the business of fashion law um, concept that we're all here to learn about today. Um, before I start, uh, Jenna did a great job explaining the basics of um, a topic that's always on the forefront of designers' minds, how do I protect my work and just echo the frustration we always have as lawyers representing designers and other creatives in this industry in the lack of ability under US law um, to effectively protect your fashion designs. Um, for, for context or for comparison, Europe has a much more effective and designer-friendly uh, statutory scheme that doesn't create all these hurdles to protection that Jenna alluded to. You know, the, the, these conceptual tests about separating things from the article and, and creating fame around a design to qualify for trade dress, these all make it harder to, uh, to protect your work and monetize your work at, um, and, and, and keep those who would uh, copy it from exploiting it. So, um, hopefully we're seeing movement in the right direction as Jenna suggested towards a more designer friendly scheme. And there's always lobbying going on in Congress to try to help the industry. And um, it, 
there are opportunities to get involved for designers as well. Um, if you ever have a chance to speak um, to any of your elected officials, particularly your Congress uh, men or women, because uh, these are typically federal statutes, let them know how important it is to the Nashville community to have strong uh, protection for creative businesses in general, including, uh, including fashion. So uh, with that, I will turn now to the, uh, as I said, the business part. And when you're starting a, a fashion business, it's very, it looks very much like starting any business. Um, typically what you're gonna wanna do is set up a separate entity from yourself to start your business, just like you would um, in any situation. And the reason we do that uh, is to protect you and your business from liability, protect uh, business liabilities from affecting your personal assets and protect personal liabilities from protect, uh, affecting your business assets. Um, two common forms that people have probably heard of on this call are the corporation and the LLC. These are legal entities. Um, that exists separately from the person running the business and are used to conduct the business. Um, a typical situation is uh, a designer and somebody funding the designer are coming together to start the business, uh, in which case they would typically both be owners of the LLC or the corporation. Um, one's obviously contributing money. Sometimes they're strategic partners who are contributing uh, production capabilities and know-how, sales capabilities, et cetera. And obviously the designers contributing the core, um, the core piece of the business that is the, the creative direction and expression that the consumer is gonna look for. So it's always very important at the outset to uh, get an entity formed pick the right form of entity, which is a decision you would make together, not only with your lawyer, but with your accountant. And as an aside, let me stress, a good lawyer is just as important as a good accountant, and vice versa, uh, and making sure you're making good bookkeeping and tax decisions as money starts coming into your company, um, you want everything properly accounted for. There are many great accountants out there with uh, experience specifically in the apparel business. Um, so seek one out at the beginning of your journey to avoid uh, mistakes that can cost you later on. Once you've picked the proper entity choice, um, you're going to need a series of agreements around who's doing what. You can't, oftentimes, we're looking at this uh, backwards. We're dealing with partners in a business who started the business and put in effort and put in time and put in money with no clear expectation as to who's supposed to do what and whether they've each met their obligations. So it's great to work it out at the beginning uh, what's, you know, as far as the, the money party, what are their obligations to fund? Are they periodic? Are they ongoing from season to season? Um, if it's a strategic partner, are you required to provide certain, um, you know, certain production rates or certain production capabilities that the failure to do so would affect your interest in the business? And with the designer, what's your commitment to the business? Do you have other, uh, do you have other obligations to other businesses? Oftentimes, you know, designers, especially starting out or working other jobs, they might be uh, working behind the scenes for larger companies while also trying to get their own label off the ground. So all of these are key components um, of the partnership agreement from the beginning. Um, it's always better to work these things out from the start so you're not fighting over it later. Uh, another uncomfortable negotiation point is what happens if this business doesn't work out because unfortunately, Oftentimes, the partnership, at least uh, at least as it exists at the beginning, doesn't work um, for one reason or another, or after some time of some success, things start to uh, deteriorate or consumer tastes move on. Um, to the to the greatest extent possible, it's a good idea to uh, provide some roadmap for an orderly dissolution. Uh, if you are the the designer in the venture, your primary concern likely is making sure that whatever creative input you put in, uh, you have a, ideally some right to take back if the partnership doesn't work out. This is especially true uh, if, you, if the label is your name. There are many historical examples of, uh, of designers going into ventures. Uh, there are many, <laughs> apologize, my daughter is with me today. Um, 
there are many historical examples of designers going into ventures, uh, contributing their name as a trademark, as Jen mentioned, the, the trademark being the brand name that you build goodwill in, to the entity, which as I mentioned is a separate legal, uh, a separate legal body from you. And when, uh, when the partnership breaks up, or when there's a change in ownership, now all of a sudden this designer no longer owns their own name. So imagine, you know, spending years getting your name recognized and then because of some twist of fate uh, in business, you no longer have the right to sell, uh, to sell clothing under your own name. So um, can you always avoid uh, this situation if you're a designer? Not necessarily. If, if somebody's bringing enough money and resources to the table that you feel the risk is worthwhile, um, you might give up rights to your name from the outset. But, uh, just, uh, 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 sorry, it's just, uh, okay. In a minute. It's, uh, it's just something to be aware of. And, and again, a very important first negotiation point for, uh, for any designer starting a business. Um, once you've got the business formed, now you're, now you're out producing goods. Um, You want to have, uh, you know, at that point, the lawyer's role shifts a little bit and the, the legal concerns you have shift a little bit from this more startup phase to an ongoing, uh, to, to an ongoing uh, outside general counsel role is really the kind of guidance that you'll need at that point. Um, again, like any other business, you're going to be hiring people, uh, employees and independent contractors, you're going to be negotiating uh, relationships with, uh, with, your production facilities with suppliers of raw materials. Um, and obviously there are, there are many, many different ways that you can produce and sell a good these days. Um, once upon a time, uh, really not too long ago, there were, there were less options for ways that you could produce and get a product to market. Now there are so many different um, resources for, for new apparel companies um, to complete this process. So, uh, depending on which avenue you choose, there are contracts around it. You want to make sure that your intellectual property, which Jenna was talking about, is uh, given due care in the process by anybody else that's handling it. Uh, you want to make sure that um, those third parties who are selling your goods, unless you're a strictly uh, direct-to-consumer brand, are uh, presenting it in the fashion that you wish it to be presented. And, and as an aside on that, obviously, um, you know, direct to consumer, I think for many reasons is, is growing in popularity so much today uh, because of, of a, the deterioration of the wholesale business in general, um, the, the inventory risk that comes with wholesale, um, the, uh, the fact that obviously your margins are much better with direct to consumer. But I think one of the most important uh, reasons is that you get to control the experience that your consumer has, both with interacting with the product, seeing its presentation, having customer service uh, issues. To, to the greater extent, um, a designer and their company can control all of that. And obviously, the, the, uh, the improved margins that come along with not having to um, sell wholesale, all, all of that I think makes it a great, uh, a great path to take. Um, back to what I was saying about uh, contracts, regardless of the path you take, whether you're selling wholesale, whether you're selling strictly direct consumer online or through your own, uh, through your own brick and mortar retail, um, there are contracts around this. So you want to make sure your rights are protected in each situation. Um, mentioning brick and mortar, uh, real estate law comes into play a lot if you're thinking about starting your own store. And this is a, uh, this can be a death valley for a lot, a lot of uh, young labels. Oftentimes, um, growing labels, even though they're having success in general, uh, during an initial growth spurt are tempted to, uh, to sign a long-term lease uh, for a store. And during slight downturns or contractions in the business, those lease obligations, which are often very firm and often personally guaranteed by one of the owners, um, become 
a weight around the company's neck. So um, we always advise a lot of caution with that. Um, sometimes brick and mortar can be a great thing um, for a young label, especially if it's uh, it has geographic significance. If you are uh, a Nashville label and having a location in Nashville is part of your branding story, in that case, uh, risks, the risks might be outweighed by the benefit, but uh, something to consider. Um, once you've gotten through this, uh, this operational life cycle, hopefully at some point, some of you might have ambitions to sell the company to a bigger fish and move on to a new creative venture. So uh, uh, this is another key point where uh where your lawyers will be involved um you'll be receiving term sheets from potential acquirers uh you'll be gathering all the legal documents that we've talked about um from your several years of operation to make your company attractive to an acquirer if this if this is something you're looking to do even if you're not selling the company in its entirety uh, there are a lot of private equity firms and venture capital firms out there that are looking to get involved is what's seen as an attractive business to be in, obviously. Um, a lot of people that make money in other industries and have extra money look to invest in entertainment, media, and fashion because it's a sexy um, type of industry to be in. And, um, you know, you want to be aware of whether an investor really uh, understands the business, whether they have other uh, similar companies in their portfolios that can create benefits for your company and help grow your business because you may well retain some small ongoing interest in the business uh, after an investment or sale or whether it's just a vanity project for them and they're going to get frustrated when they don't see the same sort of ROI that's uh, that's more predictable in whatever business they uh, they came from and made their money the first time around. So um, when you're being uh, when your company is being considered for one of these investments or an acquisition, um, all the contracts that we spoke about and all the intellectual property protection uh, strategies that Jenna uh, outlined, having done these the right way from the beginning will make your business much more valuable because at that point, um, it's being looked at under a microscope. Oftentimes, you can run a successful business for years um with the warts staying hidden from lack of a good legal and accounting structure um they raise their head the problems raise their head when either you have uh when either you have a falling out uh, amongst partners or you have an acquisition in which for the first time um somebody's really giving your business a close look so um again another reason to make sure you have your legal and accounting uh buttoned up from the beginning, obviously these are costs and budgets are always limited at the beginning, but um, you know, to the extent you can commit to these very important resources at the outset, um, it will pay off down the road. Um, so in a nutshell, that's a little bit of the uh, cradle to grave or cradle to next step um, fashion life cycle we, we often see and, and the roles that we play in it and um we always love being with clients through that entire life cycle obviously a lot of times we come in at distinct points um throughout but um it's always very rewarding to see um somebody who starts with just an idea and some grit and a vision um build something out of nothing and then turn it into uh lifetime uh life-changing success and uh, um, it's a very rewarding experience for everybody involved. And as fashion lawyers, um, we, we enjoy getting to play a part in that. So with that, um, I will, uh, I'll hand it back to Jenna for any, uh, any follow-up thoughts. I really don't have much to add. So if we want to move into some questions. I think we can um, we can do that now. We had a lot of great questions, y'all. Um, you touched on this, but just to reiterate, what would be the very first step a new designer or brand should do from a legal standpoint when they are getting started?
Well, I'm going to, I think there are two key steps and I'm going to say the first is establishing your business. And I think Jenna will probably agree that the second is trademark. And I'll, I'll let her talk a little bit more about the steps that you might take in choosing and protecting the trademark to the extent she hasn't already. Jenna, maybe just to expand on that, someone asked specifically, Beth asked, on a tight budget, is looking at something like a uh, online legal the right direction to go, or should they pick up the phone and call you? And what what is the value difference there, obviously? Hi. Um, I will definitely get to that just to expand a little bit on the on the last one. I agree with Dan. Setting up business is key because um, that protects you individually and just gets a lot um, squared away so that you can focus on the creative aspects and the more exciting um, parts of, of the formation and the creation. So trademark is definitely, I think, the next best step as that relates to um, whatever it is that you're seeking to protect. Like I said, there's a lot of options. We use trademark as a general term, but um, you know, that encompasses names, it encompasses symbols, um, smells, anything. So however that applies to you, selecting what that is, and then getting, uh, as I mentioned, you know, the proper clearance and going forward and deciding what makes sense in terms of registration. Is it um, common law or a state trademark or is it federal protection. So um, then moving into, I think you said Beth's question. Um, I, you know, I, I can't say a lot about the, the legal, the Zoom, um, legal Zoom. I think that's what was referenced. I, I will say that the benefit of having an actual lawyer um, is just someone who you can, you can call up, you have a relationship with who um, you know you know that you can pick up the phone and ask a number of questions because there there's a lot especially at the beginning um, and a lot changes um, because you're going through these steps that involve a number of decisions the outcome of any decision can change the trajectory of where you thought you were headed with your name or your brand um, for instance you may decide on a name and then the results come back from the search and there's some question as to whether it might uh, might be similar to a mark that's already being used in commerce and you have to analyze whether it um, you know it's in your best interest to to choose a different name essentially start over or um, or go forward and find a way to distinguish yourself so I think having um, you know boots on the ground, whether it's you, someone you're meeting with or just picking up the phone, getting the same person every time who knows you, who knows your business, and then who can help you, like Dan said, throughout the whole process uh, is invaluable because you're not re you know you're not reteaching um, every aspect to someone new, and I think that that's what happens when you engage in those types of relationships because it's really just, uh, you're contracting for a single purpose, you know, for submitting an application or for drafting X agreement, as opposed to um, a long-term relationship um, with counsel who can be there to help you every step of the way. Thank you. I think that was excellent advice. Um, every single penny obviously always matters to a small business, let alone when you're first starting out. And I sure hate to put you on the spot, but like if I were starting a new business and I pick up the phone to call you, could you give us a ballpark, we were being asked this question, a ballpark of what something like that might cost to get that started or how that is charged? I know that's an open-end question. Uh, just call our colleague Peter Fields who couldn't be here today and he'll do it for free if you flash him a little bit. There you go. That's what he gets for not showing up. No. Uh, wow. Yeah, that is an open-ended question. Um, again, it depends. Uh, there are a lot of variables, right? Um, you know, one point where... Maybe a safer question. Where could you start on your own before you pick up the phone and call you? 
like to do your research to check your name and and those things maybe that's a, a sure so so, so one, one thing you can do for free is a google well, first of all the uspto database which is the trademark database is available to everybody and anybody can can look at it and and try to see if the trademark they want for their business is available um we have developed years of experience in how to look and how to use search variables that make us more effective at searching but certainly as a first pass you can look at the uspto and see if there's anything that says you don't use this brand name google is an incredibly effective tool just google the name and see if you know see if there's something else that's out there um, it can be very hard to find a really original name obviously if you're using your own name for the label that's one thing but if you're not um, and um, I think it's a better idea not to for the the reason I alluded to when I was rambling before about um, the risk of losing your name to investors or, or business dissolutions. Um, the USPTO separates uh, trademark filings, or, or all countries do, in fact, all trademark authorities separate filings into uh into class categories so you're going to be filing in a particular class for apparel most likely or there, there are certain other classes that apply to other accessories you might be designing the apparel class has more filings done in it than any other class by far there are so many people who come up with ideas and file for a trademark and may or may not see it through that there are the chance of running into something that's somewhat similar um to your brand is pretty great. It's hard to find a really original name that's never been tried before. Um, but that doesn't mean you shouldn't try. So Google is a great place to start. Um, USPTO is a good place to start. And once you feel like you have something that's sort of probably a good, you know, a, a clear, a, a clear option, um, or you've narrowed it down to a few choices, um, that's where uh, an attorney can help you sort of analyze which presents the lowest risk of an opposition if you try to file it for protection with the USPTO or the lowest risk of a lawsuit from somebody else claiming you infringed um, their trademark. Obviously, you can never eliminate the risk altogether, but, um, you know, working with your attorney, um, you can identify, you know, really obvious or somewhat less obvious um, potential um, potholes that you could fall into in trying to establish a brand name. Thank you. Pat asked, I added on to that and wanted to know if there's a different process for garments that incorporate technical engineering. Now we're getting into something a little deeper. I saw that question come through um, and unfortunately I do not practice in the patent area most, uh, and I think that goes for most people within our firm. We know enough generally to touch on the protections, but that would be something you'd want to engage a patent lawyer for. Um, that is actually a separate bar from the bar that we all take. It's very technical. Um, patent lawyers have backgrounds in engineering and science for those reasons. Um, I will say that I know Google, as Dan mentioned, does have its own patent section. So I think it's patents.google.com is um, a great resource to, to view the database of patents. Um, but beyond that, I, I can't really speak anything more specifically on like the protectability um, and the, the engineering pieces definitely far outside of our wheelhouse, I think. Well, you have all obviously made um, fashion law look very exciting today because we have a lot of questions about being a fashion lawyer. What would you recommend to students who wish to practice fashion law? <laughs> Inside scoop here. Um, I think we can, I, <laughs> I think Dan and I can both answer this. I think, um, I think do it. I think uh, you, when I was in law school and I mentioned that I wanted to uh, practice in fashion law, the response was that's not real and that's not a thing. And I just kept saying, yes, it is. And I'm going to do it. And so I think um, if that is what you're interested in and passionate about, then it's a 
a lot of fun. It's great. It's an opportunity to incorporate um, the creative aspect um, of, you know, the industry into the legal world, which is, is kind of crazy. Um, that doesn't, you know, it, it's not the first thing that comes to mind when you think about being a lawyer, you know, so it's exciting for me. I've enjoyed it. And um, you just, I would say, just make it happen. Just, um, just learn, uh, continue to, to do things like this and absorb as much as you can and then find ways once you get out there to be involved and to take on clients and just start you know start building your practice even if you're not in a fashion law firm you can always start with things like trademark and copyright representation and um and then build from from there yeah what well, i i would build on what jenna just said by um Saying a, uh, I think the best way to become a fashion lawyer, or an apparel lawyer, or somebody who works with creative people, I mean, it all kind of melds together, is just to become a good lawyer. I mean, make yourself valuable to somebody who practices in this space, so that they will bring you into it, so that they will ideally either bring you into this world or make introductions uh, to you for you that will help you work your way in and meet people. Um, you know, become a good corporate lawyer so you can help people structure businesses, become a good intellectual property lawyer, become a good litigator. If you can approach somebody who's established in this business as a lawyer and convince them that you can help them on day one without making their busy lives any harder with training, then they are more likely to bring you on um, and make you part of their practice and mentor you. Um, so just don't get frustrated if you're graduating from law school and you don't find a great job posting that says fashion lawyer one at entry level. Just you can make it happen yourself. By the way, having somebody mentor you and introduce you isn't the only way to break into the business. Some people get in because they have a friend who's a designer and they help them with something and then they make an introduction. You don't need another lawyer to bring you in. But at the end of the day, you have to be a good lawyer. You have to be able to practice all these, um, all these legal disciplines competently. Um, so these are skills you can develop outside of fashion law. Then obviously once, you know, there are fashion business specific knowledge um, bases that you'll develop, but these aren't even all necessarily legal. How, how does licensing work? How does production work? Who are the people? How do you finance a, fa a fashion business? Who are the key, you know, the key people and assets um, in factoring or, um, you know, A&R lending, things like that, um, that can that can make your name better known amongst others. There, there are ways to get in. Um, you just got to keep trying. And key to all that, as I said, is making yourself a good lawyer. So, um, so you're prepared to help either another lawyer who brings you on or a fashion company that gives you a chance from day one. And we see a lot of people who become very successful fashion lawyers start, don't start out their first year out of law school as fashion lawyers. They often come to it from exactly what I just said, developing a knowledge base in a legal discipline that applies to fashion, but in an industry completely outside of fashion. Well, thank y'all. Have y'all got anything else to say before we sign off today? Anything to thank add? you to you guys and Nashville Fashion Week for letting us um, be a part of this. It's it's been great, and um, I think Dan and I would uh, you know be open to any additional questions. Um, and please don't hesitate to reach out. You can find us online. Well, thank you so much. And uh, Dan, go give your daughter a cookie. She did great. Uh, we appreciate y'all. Yeah, sorry for, sorry for the distractions today. I was a last minute stand in for my colleagues who couldn't be here, but I'm uh, very happy to be here. And thank you to everybody for coming. I'm impressed that you can talk over that and keep your train of thought. You did great. And Jenna? If you, if you saw the mess that's been created around me right now, this is an illusion. Everything yeah. else is a disaster. Yeah. Well, you, you fake it well. And Jenna, congratulations and uh, best of luck with your new baby in October.
Yeah. Um, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Don't miss our four featured designers that are going to be on Instagram um, from two to eight today. Also, we have Shop Nashville events all over town. Please hashtag YNFW. This is YNFW. Um, big thanks to MTSU for handling all of our production on our Zoom events. Um, everything has gone just very smoothly and we could not have done it without them. Please consider a donation to the Nashville Fashion Forward Fund of the Community Foundation of Middle Tennessee. That supports our local fashion community and enables us to do things like this and Nashville Fashion Week. We look forward to seeing everybody on the runway in 2021. And y'all have a wonderful day and enjoy the rest of Digital Fashion Week. Have a great day. Thank y'all.